In this video, I'm going to go through the material that um, we're looking at in week two of the muscular system. And I'm starting at the top of the notes because really this week heavily depends on us in understanding the material from week one. So what we're really talking about this week is how skeletal muscle contracts. And so the most important things uh, to remember from week one you know, it is important to know the connective tissue and so on, but um, make sure that you're really sharp on the structure of a myofibril, how the myofibril is that like strand of dried spaghetti, if that made sense to you, that an entire skeletal muscle cell is filled with these cylindrical subunits called myofibrils. And then if we look along the length of the myofibril, what we see is this particular arrangement of thick and thin filaments, okay? So we see sar called a sarcomere. And so sarcomeres run down the length of um, each myofibril and the sarcomeres of all of the myofibrils or the whole bundle of spaghetti all align within a cell that creates a banding pattern. And uh, hopefully you look at that banding pattern in lab. I'm going to look at that a little bit with you today. We need to know the structure of the thick filament, how it's made out of a protein called myosin. And that myosin, it's a big macro molecule, and it takes more than one myosin molecule to make the thick filament. It takes many of them. And so if I was going to make a thick filament, what I would do is take this golf club-looking uh, piece of protein. I'd take two of them, and I'd put them end-to-end -end so that the club uh, globular portions come out opposite each other. And that's what you're seeing here, many myosin molecules assembled such that the center of the thick filament is smooth. And then those globular head groups, or they're called cross bridges, radiate like spiral outward around the lateral um, parts of the thick filament. We also really need to know the structure of the thin filament. The thin filament is made out of three different types of protein. Primarily, you know, actin is the central core. So each of these globs is what's called G-actin or globular actin. Uh, we have two strands of those that spiral around each other. And when you have a strand of actin, you call it F-actin or fibrous actin. So the G-actin beads make up the F-actin strand. Those two uh, pieces of protein spiral around each other. And each um, bead of actin has a myosin binding site on it. Uh, but that myosin binding site, when the cell is at rest, is hidden by a second protein called tropomyosin. So this protein that looks kind of like a linear, you know, like garland going around the outside, uh, that's tropomyosin. And it's strategically placed, like I mentioned, and it, to cover all of the myosin binding sites. So it's hiding those. And then the third protein is called troponin. And troponin is a protein that's associated with the actin and with the tropomyosin uh, at regular intervals down the thin filament. And actually, if we took a close look at troponin, which hopefully you did last week, uh, one of those globules uh, attaches to tropomyosin, one attaches to actin, and then the third is a calcium receptor. So you can kind of hear how this is going to work. Calcium is going to you know, be a trigger for something to happen here. So that's a quick review on the structure of the thin filament. And then, of course, the T-tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum, very important here. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum, here it looks like the loosely crocheted sleeve. It covers the outside of every single myofibril. So it's an intracellular organelle. It surrounds each myofibril. And um, it's, it's a variation of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So you can see it's just a series of these channels and interconnected channels, tunnels. And the function of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or the SR, when the muscle is at rest is to store calcium. So we keep the free calcium level in the muscle very, very low because we use active transport. So we use energy 24 seven to take any free calcium ion that's out in the cytoplasm or sarcoplasm and put it into the SR. So the SR is continually using energy to store that calcium because we know, you know, according to the laws of simple diffusion, if I have a lot of calcium inside the SR, and no calcium outside the SR, that calcium will just diffuse out of the SR, and that happens. And when it happens, we use active transport to capture that calcium and put it back into the SR. So that's what the SR is doing. The T-tubules are a continuation of the sarcolemma or the plasma membrane. So in other words, it's a continuation from the surface of the cell 
And what the T-tubules do is they also wrap around every single myofibril, and they're associated with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the T-tubule is a membranous tunnel system that's continuous with the sarcolemma and affiliated with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the T-tubules we're going to see today are used as like a transit system. So if a message for the cell to contract is delivered on the cell surface, that message could literally like fall into the T-tubule. It would go around all the different myofibrils and the SR would be aware of it. That's a real simple way to think of it for now. So that's a little review from last week before we go into this week. And what I'm going to do this week is I want to describe the events of muscle contraction um, using pictures. I'm not going to go through the notes and like mark up every word. I'm going to let you do that because there's a lot of notes to read through. But the most important thing is to understand the story. And so this is really physiology that we're looking at this week. We're no longer just looking at like names of parts. We're trying to put the parts together in, in motion. So let's see how it goes. Um, so at the top of page seven, I have an overview of the sliding filament theory of contraction. And so all I'm trying to do in this um, bulleted list is give you like a, the big picture of this is how muscle contracts. And I'm going to switch to some pictures here. So if we know the structure of the sarcolemma, big picture, the way muscle contracts is that these thin filaments uh, get pulled over top of the thick filaments. And the way that that works is, you know, those globular head groups on the thick filament, they bind to actin, and then they start to pull actin in towards the center of the sarcomere. And this would happen at all of the filaments in all of the cell. And so when a muscle cell contracts, either the whole thing contracts or it doesn't contract. It's all or nothing. So with a muscle cell, an individual cell, the whole thing works together. It's a yes or no question. That's not the case next week. So we have to make sure to get this down at the cellular level. The whole thing's going to contract or not at all. And it will contract to its you know fullest force. It's not going to contract like light or medium or strong. It's just either yes or no. And the way that it contracts, I'm going to use my hand, see if this makes sense. Say if my fingers were um, the thin filaments, uh, the thin filaments slide over top of the thick and then they slide back when the muscle's done contracting, if that makes any sense. Okay, so in other words, the thick filaments and the thin filaments don't change length. The thin filaments slide over top of the thick, and then when the muscle's done contracting, it goes back to where it was. So this is what they're trying to show us in this picture, that here the sarcomere is at rest, and then in this picture, these globular head groups are acting kind of like a tug of war, if that makes sense, like um, uh, grabbing onto the actin and just pulling it in, uh, towards the center of the sarcomere. And so when this happens, if you know the banding pattern, which you should know the banding pattern for lecture and for lab, uh, what we're going to see is that, um, remember the light bands are called eyes, little review here. So here's an eye band. I'll mark this up. So here's an eye band, that light area. Here's another eye band. Okay, so the dark band is called the A band. And as far as the border from one sarcomere to the next, uh, the Z line that's right in the middle of the I band, that's the indicator uh, for uh, the border of a sarcomere. So there's one sarcomere in between my um, blue lines where we can see the thin filaments on the side. So that is making up half of the I band. And then the thick filaments are running down the middle and that's making up your whole A band. Now, the thin filaments are going to partially overlap the thick filaments. I can see exactly where they stop, right? This is an electron micrograph that we're looking at. It's magnified, you know, 100,000 times, or I'd have to actually look up the amount of magnification here, but it's a lot. It's more than we can get in lab. So what happens after the thin filaments, which start at the Z line and project, you know, overlap the thick filaments to a point, you get this lighter region in the middle of the A band that's called the H zone. And then the M line in the middle of the H zone, the M line is just protein that's anchoring those thick filaments in place. And technically the Z line, the boundary of the sarcomere, that's also a line of protein. And what it's doing is it's anchoring the thin filaments in place. And so when the muscle contracts, do you see how the thin filaments slide over top of the thick so that when that happens, the H zone goes away. So I can see the H zone is going away. Because the thick filaments don't change in length, do you notice how the A band 
is going to stay the same width. But because the I bands are made up of mainly the thin filaments, and the thin filaments have now slid over top of the thick, look at how minimal the I band becomes uh, during contraction. And so the banding pattern actually changes um, depending on whether the cell is relaxed or contracted. And I hope that that explanation makes sense. Please uh, let me know if not. And so looking um, back at our notes, uh, like I said, this is where I go through those basic uh, facts about the uh, muscle cell contracting. <coughs> Pardon me. And then for the cell to contract, basically here are the three events that will happen. Uh, the cell has to be told to contract. The nervous system has to tell the cell to contract. That's the events at the neuromuscular junction. And then you have to get that message to contract into all of the myofibrils. That's the excitation contraction coupling. And then the cell actually contracts, the sliding of the thin filaments over the thick. That's the sliding filament mechanism of contraction or cross bridge cycling is another term that's used. And so what I do in the notes is I just go through these three different events. So here you can see I'm overviewing what's happening at the neuromuscular junction. And then I go into the details. What does the neuromuscular junction look like? You know, what happens at the neuromuscular junction? and what is the change that occurs, you know, due to uh, release of neurotransmitter. So I'm going to take a look at that first. And you can see all of um, the videos that I'm recommending. These videos are actually contained within those IP2 activities that I'm recommending in that weekly to-do list. And so if you do those three activities that I'm recommending, you don't need to watch each of these individual videos. Those individual videos are contained within the activity, and then there's a little assessment in between. It doesn't go to the grade book. You don't have to worry about being uh, right or wrong about those. And I would definitely recommend, um, after looking at this, doing those three activities. I think it'll increase your confidence tremendously. They, they just go through it uh, so nicely, and it's animated, which is, you know, nice since we're talking about something that we can't really see. But I'm going to use pictures here to, to try to explain uh, the neuromuscular junction. So you might have looked at this in lab. The neuromuscular junction is just where a neuron is synapsing with uh, muscle cells. And basically when a neuron ends, it's going to have all these little um, many, many ends, uh, the telodendria, and um, each one of them ends in like an enlarged uh, bulb-like ending. It's called the axon terminal. So these pink linear things, these are muscle cells or muscle fibers, you know, another term for the cell. And so you can see when the um, neuron synapses with a muscle cell, believe it or not, this is um, a one-to-one -one ratio. You might have a number of endings in here, but you're not going to have another neuron synapse with this cell. So this, this location, which is known as the neuromuscular junction, this is where we're controlling the muscle cell. Keep in mind that skeletal muscle is voluntary. And so the only way it's going to contract is if the nervous system tells it to contract. And so you have to have some type of activity here at the neuromuscular junction. That's what we're going to look at. So in our book, this is just part of the picture that they show us in the book where here is um, an axon um, terminal. So this is what I mean by it might branch a little bit, but still it's just one neuron that's delivering this message. And you can see that the axon terminals, it looks like they're contacting uh, the cell. Uh, actually, there is a space between the axon terminal and the sarcolemma. Uh, but let's, let's use some really basic pictures from a, a different book to just go through the steps here, see if this makes sense. So here they're zeroed right in on the neuromuscular junction, where the blue structure, that's the axon terminal. Uh, this pink kind of um, folded line, that's the sarcolemma. And where the uh, sarcolemma is in contact with the um, axon terminal, it becomes convoluted uh, like that. People call them junctional folds. That's what the term that they use in our book. So the junctional folds, or people also say motor end plate, it's just a specialized region of the sarcolemma that will receive the message from the axon uh, terminal. And so actually, let me um, draw that, see if this makes sense. 
if we were looking at a whole muscle cell, so I'm going to draw a whole muscle fiber here, this is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say you'd have this whole big fiber, but in the one spot where it's um, that sarcolemma is contacting the exon terminal, that's where that, those convolutions are in the sarcolemma. So it's only one place on the cell. That's what you call the motor end plate or the junctional folds. And the, those junctional folds are there because, you know, the neuron, this is, is ending. Okay, so there'd be many endings there. We'll talk about neurons in the next unit. But that axon terminal, it doesn't contact the motor end plate. There's this fluid-filled gap in between the two. That's what's known as the synaptic cleft. And this whole area is what we would call a synapse, right? Because one cell is going to communicate with another cell. And so the neurotransmitter receptors are located on the motor end plate. And that's actually why, you know, it's folded up like that. It, it gives it more surface area to respond to the message coming from the nervous system. So so this is what we're zeroed in on in this picture. So taking a look at in the axon terminal, you can see membranous vesicles filled with these red dots. Those red dots are the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the only neurotransmitter that's used at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so if we're talking about the neuromuscular junction, then we're talking about acetylcholine being the neurotransmitter there. Uh, they're, and here they're just shut, setting up the anatomy. So axon terminal, uh, these vesicles are called synaptic vesicles, the membranous vesicles filled with the neurotransmitter. We can see the synaptic cleft. Okay, they're using the double-headed arrow there. Here's the sarcolemma, the junctional folds or the motor end plate. Here, these purple things, these are receptors for acetylcholine. So these are acetylcholine receptors. And then these little half moon uh, things that you can see kind of hanging out in here, that's an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase that degrades acetylcholine. And so there's already a plan in place that if acetylcholine is released, uh, it will bind to the acetylcholine receptor and um, momentarily, and then the acetylcholinesterase is going to chop it in half. So the way that this works is you can see if that neuron experiences what's called an action potential or a nerve impulse, which we'll talk about in the next unit, sorry about that. Think about it as like um, an electrical um, current that goes down the cell. And when that electrical current reaches the very end of the cell, that's what they're showing us here in red, uh, that it's sweeping across the axon terminal, that's gonna be the trigger that causes a release of neurotransmitter. And the way that that happens is as that electric current sweeps across the axon terminal, it's going to open um, calcium channels. We're going to have a calcium influx into the cell, calcium ions. And those calcium ions are involved in the exocytosis of the acetylcholine. So I'm going to move forward in the pictures. So looking at the next picture, um, you can see exocytosis of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft occurred. Next thing that's going to happen is that acetylcholine is going to bind to the acetylcholine receptors. So we can see that happening here. Acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptors and they're a little um, abstract in this picture. They're just showing us that sodium's coming in. And so I'll show you, the picture in our book is more um, detailed. These acetylcholine receptors are actually chemically gated um, sodium channels. And so what happens when acetylcholine binds is the channel opens. It's typically closed, so the sodium channels are closed here. Acetylcholine binds, and then those sodium channels open. Because we have a high concentration of sodium in the extracellular fluid and a low concentration of sodium in the cytoplasm, passively, sodium will move in to the muscle cell. And it's going to make, it's going to change the charge inside the muscle cell. Sodium carries a single positive charge. And so the inside of uh, the sarcolemma is be going, to, going to become more positive or less negative. You could think of it either way. Uh, and once we have that influx of sodium changing, you know, the charge inside of the muscle cell, the acetylcholinesterase is breaking down that acetylcholine. And so to take a look at the uh, picture in our book, see if this makes sense. This is the events at the neuromuscular junction. Uh, what's going to happen is uh, an electric current is going to sweep down the cell. 
It's going to sweep across the exon terminal, causing an influx of calcium, which is just part of the exocytosis process. Some of these synaptic vesicles are going to fuse with the exon terminal, release acetylcholine by exocytosis. That acetylcholine is going to diffuse across the synapse. It's going to bind to acetylcholine receptors. But as I was saying, the acetylcholine receptor, they draw this really nice and clear here, is actually a chemically gated sodium channel. So once um, the acetylcholine binds, this channel opens, sodium comes into the cell, sodium carries a single positive charge. And so what we see is the inside of the cell becomes more positive. That's what we call a depolarization, which I'm going to define better in the next unit. We're warming up to all these ideas right now, so we'll cover this in greater detail in Unit 5. But basically, that positive charge, we're not going to be able to leave it right there in the cytoplasm, right? What they're showing you with this wave of depolarization is it's going to diffuse, it's going to drift into adjacent areas. And in the adjacent area, what you have is you have voltage-regulated sodium channels. And all you need for this muscle cell to contract is enough positive charge to come in at the motor end plate to change the voltage here so that these voltage regulated channels will open. So something along the lines of, you know, positive 10 millivolt change will cause these uh, voltage regulated sodium channels to open. So that's what they're showing in this picture, actually. They're showing voltage regulated sodium channels open, sodium rushes in, and that's what you call an action potential. An action potential is triggered once you open those voltage-regulated sodium channels. And there's more to the action potential, as many of you know. I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'm going to leave it at this, and we're going to pick up from here in Unit 5. So if we do initiate an action potential, all you need to do to do that is get enough positive charge in the cell to open those voltage-regulated sodium channels. And the thing about generating an action potential is that that is a self-perpetuating uh, uh, electric current. So if you generate an action potential, there will be an exact electric current that's going to sweep down the entire length of the cell. The way that I describe this in class, if this makes any sense, is if you think of the sarcolemma as being, say, like the, a line of gasoline, if once you open this voltage-regulated sodium channel, it's like dropping the match on it. You know, that fire or that action potential will spread down the entire length of the axon without, uh, pardon me, the muscle cell without um, diminishing uh, with distance. So um, that's the events of the neuromuscular junction. Take a look at a few more pictures. So they go through this in the book. So what we're um, looking at is just release of acetylcholine, opening chemically gated sodium channels, causing a depolarization, that depolarization spreading to adjacent areas, initiating an action potential. That's basically what we're talking about. Now, in the second process, um, which is excitation contraction coupling, what this means, excitation, is how are you going to get that message to all of the myofibrils? Think of, say, like a bodybuilder. You know, muscles are all different sizes. Muscle cells are all different sizes, making the muscles all different sizes. But a muscle cell, if you think of it as the bundle of myofibrils, like we talked about last week, it could be, you know, small, like a, a small bundle of spaghetti, or it could be the whole box of spaghetti. You see what I'm saying? If it's the whole box of spaghetti, you're going to be able to generate more uh, force, which we'll talk about next week. But basically, you know, the the force generated is, is proportional to like the interaction that you have in, in the cell. So how are we going to get that message that was delivered at one point, you know, at the uh, motor end plate to all those myofibrils? That's what excit excitation contraction coupling is about. You know, how that message is going to get through. So let me use some pictures and try to explain that. So a picture from our book. Here they're giving us the bigger picture. They're showing release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, a depolarization at the motor end plate that let enough sodium in that went over to an adjacent area, opened voltage-regulated sodium channels, initiating an action potential. That action potential is now going to spread down the sarcolemma. And remember how the T-tubules are continuous with the sarcolemma? That depolarization will fall into the T-tubule. Not only will it fall into the T-tubule, but it will start moving forward. So if that line of gasoline um, analogy made sense, it's almost like saying, you know, because the T-tubules are continuations of the sarcolemma, 
the T tubes would be the gas line too. It would be a continuation. So say when the fire hits here, it goes down the T tubule and it moves forward to the next T tubule and it moves forward. So taking another look, let's take a look at this picture. It's easier to see, bigger. When uh, that electric current uh, reaches a T tubule, it falls into the T tubule, it also moves forward. The T tubules are associated with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, this particular area of the SR that's called a terminal cisterna. Uh, it's just, you know, the part that's in contact with the T tubule. That's all. It still stores calcium. But that electric uh, current going down the T tubule will trigger release of calcium from the SR. And that's how we're getting the message to every single myofibril to contract because these T tubules surround every myofibril. Every, the sarcoplasmic reticulum surrounds every myofibril. So when that electric uh, current goes down the T-tubule, you can think of it as it's going to shock the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium, and that's what you call excitation-contraction coupling. Uh, what will happen next is the actual contraction of the muscle. And we know for the actual contraction of the muscle, what we said for uh, cross-bridge uh, cycling or the sliding of the filaments is that the thin filaments are going to slide over top of the thick. So just looking at this picture, look at the proximity of the thin and thick filament. So I can see the thin is overlapping the side of the sarcomere where those globular head groups are. Now remember that actin has binding sites for myosin, but they're just being covered up by that protein called tropomyosin that looked like the garland. And so myosin can't bind to actin unless calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If calcium is released, what will happen is, remember, one of the um, pieces of the troponin is a calcium receptor. Calcium will bind to troponin. And in, in this picture, calcium hasn't bound to troponin yet. So do you see how the tropomyosin, which is the orange strand, is still covering those myosin binding sites like they're drawing as um, dark uh, dots? Uh, so it's still covering it up. So myosin can't bind to actin. It would love to at any given time, but it can't. It's being blocked. It's being strategically blocked by tropomyosin. But once calcium is available, taking a look at the next picture, calcium will bind to troponin. And when that happens, tropomyosin moves out of the way. And you can see how the myosin binding site is now exposed. Passively, no energy required. The globular head group on myosin will bind to actin. And after it binds to actin, you might remember that there are two hinges on the myosin molecule. Uh, hopefully, I talked about it in that in the video about myosin. There's um, um, a hinge right at the globular head group. So, you know, this makes sense if, like, my arm is the myosin molecule and, say, here's the globular head group. It can pivot. And there's also a hinge on the tail portion. So what happens when myosin binds to actin, you can see that tail hinge is already... Uh, bent, binds, and then that head group bends, okay? And so it, that's how we pull the thin filament in towards uh, the center of the sarcomere. This one pull of the myosin um, head group or the myosin cross bridge, uh, this is known as a power stroke. And so altogether, uh, excitation contraction coupling and uh, sliding of the filaments, the message, the action potential, will go down the T-tubules, down the whole sarcolemma. When it falls into the T-tubules, which is surrounding every single myofibril, it will shock the SR. SR releases calcium. Calcium binds to troponin, moves the tropomyosin out of the way. Myosin binds to actin, power stroke. And actually, this will keep happening. So after this happens, you, it's not stuck there. Uh, once, here's, here's some closer pictures. Uh, once myosin binds to actin, this is what you call a cross bridge formation. That's why they call these globular cross bridges, um, or the globular head groups cross bridges, because it forms like a little, you know, bridge-like connection between the thick filament and the thin filament. So um, once we have uh, tropomyosin moved out of the way, because calcium bound to troponin, we get cross bridge formation. And then the globular head group will pull the thin filament in towards the center of the sarcomere. That's what's known as a power stroke. 
Now, for the myosin to let go of actin, this is where we need energy. Believe it or not, this is the active part. So it doesn't take any um, energy, believe it or not, for you know that cross bridge formation and the contraction portion. But now you need energy to make myosin let go. And so ATP is necessary to make myosin let go. And then the ATP is broken down into ADP, so adenosine triphosphate into the diphosphate and free phosphate, and that energy is used to re-straighten out the myosin molecule back into what it's called its high energy conformation. <coughs> Pardon me. And as long as calcium is available, this will happen again. And so let's say we just straightened this out and we pulled that thin filament in towards the center of the sarcomere, it will form another cross bridge. It will power stroke, it will use energy to let go, it'll get straightened back out, and then it will attach again, power stroke again, let go, that's where the energy is needed, then we use the energy to straighten it out. And so this is kind of like a tug of war. So like if I'm bound to uh, the thin filament, I can pull the thin filament in, but just like tug of war, I have many um, team members, or even like with me, I wouldn't move both my hands at once. And so when, when one myosin detaches, the other one's still attached. And so when a myosin attaches, you shouldn't um, be concerned that like the thin filament's going to slide back to where it was. It's actually stabilized by other myosin that's still attached. And so kind of like tug of war, the myosin will all work asynchronously to pull the thin filament in towards the center of the sarcomere. Once the um, action potential is no longer there, and just going back to our picture, this one, um, and there's no more electric current going down the T tubule, what will happen is we'll use active transport, we'll use energy uh, to collect back all that calcium. So we'll take it right off the troponin, and so tropomyosin will move back in the way, and so at a point, that's what stops contraction. In order to contract, you have to have that signal, and that signal came from the nervous system. When you no longer have that signal, the calcium is brought back into the SR. One of these times when the tug of war, myosin goes back and it wants to bind actin, but can't find the binding site because it's covered up by tropomyosin again. So I know that is a lot, and that's why I have the three activities in the, um, the weekly to-do list. I think, like I said, once you go through those activities, they will, um, they will help tremendously they'll help you put this uh, together, and so will I. So please let me know what questions you have. But what we did today is we looked at what muscle contraction looks like overall, and then we went through um, these three events, the neuromuscular junction, which is page seven, how we distribute that message to the cell, that's top of page nine, excitation contraction coupling, and then the sliding of the filaments, which is cross bridge cycling, that's on page nine. Okay, and you can go through this little like step by step. And I tried to also write it out step by step uh, for you. And then this picture is just an overview, putting together the excitation contraction coupling and um, the contraction and relaxation. And so uh, here we have a brand new topic, which we'll, we'll uh, tackle in week three. So I hope this helps. Thank you.